So I heard about a pastor that was sitting in his office one afternoon, and he decided he was going to go out and do a little ministry work, because that's what pastors do, right? So he decided uh, the ministry that he was going to do, he was going to go see an elderly lady that he hadn't seen in church for a while, and he was going to go visit her. And So he went over to her house, and she invited him in, and he sat down at the couch with her, and uh, she was sitting in the chair right next to him, and as he was visiting with her, the conversation ended up being a little lengthy, and he was sitting there, and his stomach started growling a little bit, he started getting a little bit hungry, and he looked down on the coffee table, and he said, this big bowl of peanuts that she had there on the, on the coffee table. So he just kind of reached down, helped himself, and just kind of started eating the peanuts while they were sitting there having conversation and everything, you know. And before he knew it, the whole bowl was completely gone. He'd eaten them all. And he looked at her and he said, I am so sorry. He goes, I ate all your peanuts. He said, I wasn't even paying attention. I just ate them all. And she said, that's okay. Don't worry about it. She said, ever since I had my teeth taken out three weeks ago, all I've been able to do is just chuck, suck the chocolate off of it and put it back in the bowl. <laughs> never happened to me, praise God. <laughs> but you know, when you put yourself out there for ministry, administering to others, you just don't know what's going to happen, right? Uh, some things could happen that's good and a blessing, and other things can, uh, can be, well, that was enjoyable and different, but we put ourselves out there. You know, today, I just want to get some thoughts stirred around in your head. I just want to ask you a few questions just to kind of get our brains work it just a little bit and, and kind of our thoughts going in the direction that I kind of want to take you today. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And as I ask you these questions, I just want you to kind of do your own heart check and I just want you to think on the inside and just kind of maybe answer some of these questions to yourself as I ask them to you. And the first question is, is when you think of the word church, when you think of church, what do you think your role is in church? If any. How do you view church? What's your role in church? Do you think a church is like something you simply go to and it just happens to be Life Point Church? That's where I go to church and that this is something that I go to. Is that how you view church? Do you think that your role is to just come every once in a while whenever you feel like it when there's nothing else going on? Is that how you view church when you think of it? When you think of church, do you view church kind of like a spectator sport? You know, I want to come to church and I just kind of want to watch it. I just want to kind of watch what's going on. I just want to kind of sit back. I have no desire to do anything else. I just kind of want to watch and kind of see what's going on. And in fact, I really wish they would have left that back door unlocked so I could come in and leave in that door, you know, without having to really go noticed or have to do anything. Is that what you think about as you think about church? Do you think of it as just simply you're a spectator? Or do you think of church as just kind of another activity? You know what I mean by that? We all got plates we're spinning, right? We have all these extra plates that we're spinning. And have we labeled church as just one of those plates that we're spinning that we're just kind of trying to keep that going along with our hobbies, along with our job, along with you know all the extracurricular things that we're going on. It's just kind of another activity. It's just another plate that's spinning. And unfortunately, when we have this overwhelming calendar, guess what the first plate is to let go? Could that be you in your life? When you view church, do you look at it as just an activity? Or when you think of church, do you view it at it from a consumer perspective? You know, a consumer, because we got rights, right? We all want to be taken care of. We all want to be, you know, have everything kind of cushy. So when you think of church, do you think of church just from a consumer perspective? Like, what can the church do for me? How can the church bless me? How can they take care of me? What they, can they do for me? Come on, Carrie, lead the music good. Come on, Kevin, Brett, Mark. Come on, preach me a good message. What can I do? And then it's what happens when we have this consumer mentality when it comes to church. Then we almost look at church as almost like kind of a cafeteria or a buffet style. How many of you like buffets? Oh, man, I love buffets, you know. You can pick a little of this, get a little of that, and go back for a little bit more of this. You can reject that. You don't have to eat that. Remember, I love broccoli. Not enough to eat it, though. So, you know, I can kind of push that to the side. And see, that's what we do with church sometimes. We come in and we're like, I want a little of that, I want a little of that. Oh, the preacher's talking about that, so I'm gonna, I don't want any of that. So we come across it kind of like this consumer perspective. So what did you think about when you think about church? And do you think that you even have a role when it comes to church? How do you view church? Let me ask you another question. What's your thoughts when you hear the word ministry? When you hear the word ministry? And what do you think your role 
as coming to Life Point Church, what do you think your role is in the life of ministry? Do when you think of the word ministry, do you think, well, ministry is for someone else? Right? Ministry is for someone else. Somebody that's more qualified. Somebody that's went to seminary. Somebody that's got an education when it comes to that. You know how many hours I got in seminary? Zero. I went to the school of hard knocks. <laughs> Learned the hard way. So what do you think about when it comes to ministry? Somebody that's more qualified does that. Somebody that's got more time than what I have. Maybe some ministry is for someone that's on staff. I mean, after all, isn't that what we pay them for? Isn't that why I give? So we can pay these hired people to go and do the works of ministry. What do you think about? And what do you think your role is, particularly in the ministry at Life Point Church? Or do you think that you even have a role when it comes to ministry? Here's my final question for us to chew on for just a moment. What do you think of when you think of the word minister? Minister. You say, well, that's easy. A minister is a pastor, right? A minister is somebody that gets paid to do ministry. Maybe you think of minister as somebody that's a priest or a missionary or an evangelist. Maybe that's the word, that's, maybe it's not some of your thoughts when you think of the word minister. Is that your thoughts when it comes to that? Now guys, here we go. You know, I, I kind of gave you some things to think about this morning because I really want you to think about church for just a moment. And I really want you to think about what your role is as a believer. What's your role as a believer in the church? Now, if you can relate to some of those answers that I was suggesting there in the front, now can I tell you, I'm not picking on you. I'm not beating you up. I'm not trying to sit here and think, boy, that's a, 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 a wonderful welcome to the church. Make me feel guilty for all of these things. If that was some of your thoughts, I'm honestly not trying to do that. Because here's the deal, guys. Can I tell you that I thought just like that? Those were all answers that I had at one part of my life. Some of those answers I, were my answers before I got saved. And some of them were even answers that I gave after I got saved. But I, when I look back at some of those answers, I gave some of those answers because of one or two things. If I was saved, I was either uneducated or I lacked the confidence to step out and do what God's called me to do. So maybe you're in here today and you really are a born-again believer. You really do have Jesus. You're not doing a whole lot. And I'm not trying to beat you up. I just want to educate you on what the Bible says so you understand what it looks like to really be a part of the body of Christ. And honestly, that's the whole point of this sermon series that we're going through, Count Me In. We want to educate you. We want to educate you. We want you to understand what that looks like and how you can be a part of that and what it looks like. Guys, this sermon series, as we've said, every single Sunday, it's not a membership drive. We're not looking to just get your name on the church roll. That has nothing to do with anything that we're looking at. We simply want to educate you on what the Bible says it looks like to be part of His church. Because can I tell you, there's nothing more glorious than to be a part of His church. There's nothing more exciting here on this earth to be a part of His church and to be able to take the gospel out with other people connected and joined together and make a difference for Christ. There's nothing any better. So we want, through this sermon series, we encourage you that we want you to take a serious look at your life and we want you to raise the bar in your life. And can I tell you that bar is not being set by Life Point Church. The bar is being set by the Word of God 2,000 years ago when the church was birthed. Amen? That's why we're going to Scripture and looking and seeing what God says about the church. See, here at Life Point Church, we believe that when you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, and when I say make Him your Lord and Savior, I'm not saying just you believe in just some wonderful concept, but a belief means that you really are deeply rooted, that you really believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And when you say you believe, that means that I want to be a follower of Christ. I'm leaving everything behind and I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to follow Him. And whatever it is that He wants out of my life, I'm going to give. It would kind of be like you jumping in a car behind me and you had no idea how to get to Kansas City. And I said, hey, follow me. I know the way. And if you're following me, what would you do? Follow me, right? You would go where I went. If I sped up, you would speed up. If I slowed down, you would slow down. If I went right, you would go right. If I went left, you would go left. That's what it means to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow Him in whichever way, in whichever direction He's taken me in my life. That is the direction that I'm going to go. So at Life Point Church, we believe that you're actually a member of the body of Christ when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And not just this body of believers, but every Christian that's ever lived 
in every part of the world. We are connected to the body of Christ. What a glorious thing that is to know that we have connections across the world. And that's what it means to be a part of the body. But then also we believe that there's several scriptures throughout the Word of God that says that we need to be connected with a local body of believers. That we need to be connected. We need to pray through and know where God wants us to be connected and to serve with other believers. And at Life Point Church, we call that partnership. We don't call it membership. We call it partnership. And there's several uh, kinds of terminologies found in the New Testament. But the one that we've been focusing on and the one we've got our partnership under is Philippians 1.5. It'll come up on your screen. And the Apostle Paul... He's actually thanking the church at Philippi for their financial support. And he says this, because of your partnership, everyone say partnership. partnership. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The Apostle Paul recognized them as partners in the ministry. So last week, you know, if you wasn't here, each family was given one of the partnership agreements that, that looked like this. And also, we tried to pass them out today to the families that wasn't here last week. So if you didn't get one today or last week, I encourage you to try to grab one on your way out. Take it home. Pray about it because you need to know who we are. You know, the partnership agreement is really our fingerprint. You know, every church is different. Every church operates and looks different. And, and, and so our fingerprint is our identity. It's who we are. It's how we operate. It's what we believe. It talks about in there the leadership's obligation to its partners. But then it also talks about your obligation to the church from a biblical perspective, what that looks like. So I encourage you to get one of them if you haven't. You know, we have a few more weeks left in this series. I've had several people already sign it and say, hey, where do I turn this in? We want you to just hold on to it a little bit more until we're finished. And then we're going to give everybody the opportunity to sign that. Now, if you were here a couple of years ago, it's been in place, and you could say, well, I've already signed one. You know what? Thank you for signing that and being a part of that a couple of years ago. But you know what we're doing? We're wiping the slate clean. We have no partners. Each year, we're going to ask you to sign another covenant. Because you know what? People change. Circumstances change. People move. People go away. And we don't want a lifetime membership. We want to know that in 2018, man, we're going to partner with Life Point Church to go raise people for the gospel of Christ. Amen? Amen? So that's what we're asking you to do. I pray that if for some reason you miss one of these services or you've missed the last two, please go online and watch them because we really want everyone on the same page so we understand what it looks like. So our partnership... Um, Covenant is something that, that really, like I said, illustrates who we are and how we walk. In the last couple of weeks, here's what we've looked at. We've looked at what it looks like to partner with us in fellowship. And we looked at what it was partnered like in worship. And then this week, bouncing off my earlier questions, is what it looks like to partner with us in ministry. What does that look like to partner with us in ministry? So to understand a biblical partnership, we first got to get out of our thinking. We've got to el eliminate some things. We have to eliminate the thinking that there's Lone Ranger quit Christians. Even Lone Ranger wasn't really the Lone Ranger, was he? He had Tonto. Right? So there's really no Lone Ranger Christians. So just get that thought and that concept out of your mind. I also want you to get out of your thinking that we don't have to be connected. Let's get that out of our thinking as well because that's just unbiblical. We also have to get out of our thinking that we can just sit down and do nothing. That's unbiblical too, so we got to get that out of our thinking. We also get out of, got to get out of our thinking that ministers are only pastors or paid staff because that is definitely unbiblical, so we got to get that out of our thinking as well. Listen, church, the Bible says that, number one in your outline, that every believer is a minister. Every believer is a minister. Say that with me. Everyone's a minister. Now say, including me. That was weak. It's easy to say that everyone's a minister, right? But when you start personalizing it and saying, including me, I'm a minister. Think about that. Just say that to yourself. I'm a minister. Have you ever thought about that before? That's a little harder to say, isn't it? It's a little harder to swallow that I'm a minister. It's easier to say everybody's a minister or every believer's a minister. But then when you personalize it, it makes it a little bit harder. You want to know why? Because with that thought of everybody's a minister, including me, when it comes with the thought that you're a minister, I'm a minister, it raises the level of responsibility, doesn't it? That word feels like it comes with responsibility. It raises the level of accountability. And some of us, we don't want any more responsibility. We don't want any more accountability, do we? We just want to kind of come to church and just have church service as a little pick-me-up. 
and we're missing on what it looks like, guys. For instance, a couple years ago, well, it's been more than that, Josie just started her senior year in college. Can you believe that, for those of you that remembers us sending her off? But I remember we had this conversation with Gracie, who was our middle child before we adopted three others. And, uh, and so we had this conversation with, jo or with Gracie. And I said, we said, Josie, Rhonda and I, said, you know what, Josie, or Gracie, Josie fills a huge role in this house. She carries a lot of responsibility. She does a lot of things. And you know what, when she leaves, you've got some really big shoes to fill. You're going to have to really step up. And Gracie looked at us with them big blue eyes, and she said, whoa. <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. She said, I'm perfectly happy with being the middle child with no responsibility. <laughs> she was perfectly content with Gracie or Josie taking care of everything. But you know what? Can I tell you, over these last three years, as we've handed off that responsibility to Gracie, can I tell you, she's really stepped up. She stepped up. And I'm telling you what, with that extra load, with that extra responsibility, she has rised to the occasion. And she does an amazing job. And next year, we're going to be sending her off to college. And we're going to have to have that conversation with Sam and Lucy that they've got some pretty big shoes to fill now because of Gracie's emptiness. See, guys, just similar to just like Gracie stepping up and doing an amazing job, can I tell you that when you realize as a believer, when you realize that you're a minister, and you realize that that comes with a greater responsibility and holds you more accountable, can I tell you, it changes the way you do life. And can I tell you, you will rise to the occasion if you can start getting that into your thinking that you're a minister. And it'll change the way you act. It'll change the way you live. It'll change the way you do things. And I promise you, like Gracie, you'll really step up your game. Listen, guys, you and I are here on this earth to make a contribution. We are. We're here on this earth to make a contribution. Uh, God didn't just create us to simply eat, to simply breathe, to simply just take up space and to live for our own selfish pleasures. He created us for a purpose. And that purpose is to serve Him. That's why God created us, is to serve Him. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10. And it's, the scripture is going to come up here on the screen. It says this. It says that, for we are all God's handiwork. Say that with me, handiwork. handiwork. You ever thought of yourself as God's handiwork? It says that we are all God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So way before, way before we ever existed, way before we was ever a thought, way before our parents or our great-grandparents, way before the beginning of time, God had a purpose for us. He had a plan for each and every one of us. Jeremiah says something similar in Jeremiah 1.5. He says that God says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nation. So God says, hey, Jeremiah. Hey, guess what? I knew you. I created you. And I had a plan for you. And I wanted to set you apart for some special work. And can I tell you, God says the same thing about you. The same thing about me. The same thing about each and every one of us. God says, you know what? You weren't an accident. I don't care what your circumstances that brought you into this world. You're not an accident. You're not an accident. You're God's handiwork. And God created every single one of us, and not just pastors or paid staff, but every single one of us to do good works. To do good works. Everyone say that. Say good works. Good works. You see, you know, good works that he's talking about is your service. That's the good works that he's talking about. It's your service to the Lord. So when we serve others, we're actually serving God. When we serve others, we're actually serving God. And that means we're fulfilling one of the purposes that he's created, created us to do, and that's ministry. That's ministry. He's created us all. You see, in the Bible, the words servant and the word minister, they're synonyms. It means the same thing. So when you see the word servant, you're seeing the word minister. It means the same thing. But also service and ministry are also synonyms as well. So as we look through that and we see servant or service, we're seeing minister or ministry. So if you are a believer, you're a minister. So say that with me again. I'm a minister. I'm a minister. Isn't that awesome? You've all been ordained to be a minister today. <laughs> What'd you do at church? I was ordained. I was set apart to be a minister today at church. And when you're serving, you're doing ministry. Listen, guys, I believe that one of the greatest tragedies for the church, I believe one of the greatest tragedies is the lack of teaching that every believer is a minister. I believe that that's one of the greatest hindrance because it puts way too much emphasis on the pastors doing all the work. Amen? 
It puts way too much emphasis on us doing it or the paid staff being the ministers. You know what the Bible says? We're reading out of Ephesians 2. You know what the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12? You can write that down and go look it up. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell you what it says. It says that he's gifted some of us to be pastors, apostles, teachers. But you know what our point is? You know what the purpose is for being a pastor? It says to equip the saints to go out and do the works of the ministry. Isn't that cool? Our jobs is not to do all the work. It's to teach you guys how to go and do all of the work and to minister to others. You know, last week, uh, or last week, last night, I was on the way back from Lawrence, Kansas, because Lucy had a ball game, and uh, three ball games. And uh, so I'm, I'm on the way back. It's during the evening, and I get a phone call from the hospital that somebody in our congregation is in the ER and wanted to visit uh, from me. And... That's a problem. I'm two hours away. So I got on the phone, and, uh, well, Kevin's out of town this week. If you hadn't noticed, him and Tammy is out of town. They'll be back Monday. But uh, So he's gone, and I call Mark, and I tell Mark's situation. Well, the problem is Mark's in Cameron. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, all three of the pastors, and then I'm thinking, okay, we've got a whole bunch of ministers in our church, right? Not just the pastors. So I made another phone call, and you know what? Somebody in the congregation went out and paid them a visit. And you know what? This person works in an office here in town. But they view themselves as a minister of the gospel of Christ. It's not just the pastor's job, amen? amen. All the way throughout the Scriptures, 58 times to be specific, the Bible says that we're to love one another, to care for one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to help one another, to counsel one another, to support one another. And it goes on and on and on. Listen, friend, that's ministry. Amen? That's ministry, and that's what God's called us to do. And as a pastor, as a pastor, I have the amazing privilege and the responsibility of doing every single one of those things. But can I tell you, I've been given no more of the responsibility than any of you guys. We've all been given that responsibility to go out and minister. God's called us all to be ministers. It's your job and mine. We just have different roles. We just have different roles to get the job done. You know, Life Point, we don't have just three ministers that are paid pastors on staff. We have 600 plus ministers. Man, we can do a lot of things in Chill Coffee, don't you think? If everybody had the understanding that they were a minister. Guys, can I tell you, that's how God's going to use this church to be the light of the world. That's how God's going to use this church to go out and to reach people. And listen to this, guys. Here's the deal. When you understand that you're a minister then you know what? You change the way you're thinking. You're no longer a teacher that just happens to go to church. Now you're a minister and God's placed you in a role speaking to a bunch of impressionable young people, right? When you understand that you're not just a nurse that goes to church, you understand that God's given you the assignment of being a minister in the mission field of those that are hurting and that are sick and that are coming to you. When you understand that you're a minister and not just a construction worker, then you understand that you're following in the footsteps of the greatest carpenter of all, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It changes the way you do things. When you understand that you're not a police officer or a prison guard that just goes to church, then you're going to understand that you're a minister in a mission field amongst a bunch of people that desperately needs to be rehabilitated. Amen? When you understand that you are just not who you are for a living, that you are a minister, and that's where God's got you, whether it's a factory, whether it's a, a, a restaurant, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's a beauty parlor, or whether it's whatever it is. When you understand that that's where I'm at and I'm a minister, it changes everything. I had a friend that worked at a factory for a lot of years, and he's later on went on to be a pastor of a church out of state. But he said, you know what? All those guys down there called me preacher. What a cool compliment. They call you preacher where you work? Do they even know that you go to church? Do they know that you're a minister? Guys, we've got to change our thinking. We're ministers. We are ministers. Say that with me one more time because I'm going to drive it home. I am a minister. Amen. Guys, listen. When you really believe it, it's going to change your life. So when you partner with Life Point Church in the ministry, you understand that number one, every believer is a minister. And number two, you believe that every minister does their part. You believe that every minister does their part. So as I've already shared with you in my last point, 
We're to be contributing, uh, contri uh, contributing members of the body of Christ. And partnering with LifePoint means that you're contributing your part to the local body of believers. So say this with me again. I'm a minister. I'm going to do my part. Guys, listen. There's several ways that you can do your part. Several ways. And we have those ways listed in the partnership covenant under ministry. That's why we want you to look at it. You know, some of the ways you can contribute by giving of your time. By giving of your time. Are you devoted to the church? You know, the early believers were devoted. Man, they were poured into it. Are you devoted to the church? Is it a number one priority in your life? Do you love God's church? Do you love being connected? Do you offer that and pour yourselves in? You need to be giving of your time, being devoted. But you also contribute with your money. Oh, no, this is not going to be a sermon on money, is it? No, it's really not. But I am going to talk about it. Are you a giver? Do you give? Do you believe in the ministry of Life Point Church? You know, we believe that every person is supposed to tithe. That's 10%. It changed my life when I gave it to God. How do you think ministry gets done? How do you think you're sitting in the seats that you're sitting in? How do you think you get to come in out of the cold and enjoy the heat or out of the heat and enjoy the cooler temperatures? How do you think we get to buy the material that we teach and, and put it into your hands? How do you think we get to do everything that we get to do? It's because of people step, faithfully stepping up and saying that I'm going to partner with LifePoint by giving my tithe. Have you trusted God in that? But then the other way that you can contribute, and this is where I really want to focus today, is you can contribute by serving others in the way that God has wired you. In the way that God has wired you. You know, I really desperately want you to understand who you are, how God's created you, and what you can do, and how He specifically made you to bring Him glory with your life. So we're going to camp out on this for just a little bit. 1 Peter 4.10, which is another scripture in your bulletin, and it'll come up here on the screen. <laughs> Peter says this. He says, God has given each one of you a gift. Say that with me, gift. Yeah. So God has given each one of you a gift, and from His great variety of spiritual gifts. So in other words, there's a whole bunch of spiritual gifts, and God has given you a gift. And He says to use them well to serve one another. Listen, guys, we were created to serve God, but everyone's service part is different. We're all different. You know, just like you think of animals. You know, uh, animals, some of them are made to run, some of them are made to fly, some of them are made to swim. And can I tell you, when you take a fish and try to make it swim, it's not going to work very good. Right? If you take a bird and stick it in the water with your fish tank, it's probably not going to last very long. They're all wired specifically different to do something different. Guys, can I tell you the same truth holds true with us? God has wired each and every one of us specifically different to serve a different role because we are God's handiwork, remember? He's shaped us all and molded us all different. How many of you remember the book that came out in 2002, uh, The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren? Anybody read that book? Let me see. Raise a hand. For some of you that's read this book, some of the things that I'm going to share with you, it might be a repeat. But I got that book out and I was reading it as kind of as I studied. You know, this book was amazing. I got saved in 2000. So it came out soon after I got saved. And I remember reading it. And it made a huge impact in my life because it helped me understand my purpose. It helped me understand how God had wired me and shaped me. And I encourage you that if you've never read that, you probably ought to go back in and read that book because it's amazing. And if you do have it, get it back off your shelf and reread it. But you know, as I was reading that, I didn't even know, and I couldn't even remember that it was in there, but it goes right along with everything that we've even got in our partnership that we've been writing about. It tells us that our purpose is that God made us to worship Him. Didn't we already cover that? It says that God made us to fellowship with Him. We've already made that, or we've already talked about that. God made us, our purpose is to minister with others. And our purpose is to grow through discipleship and to share with others, which is the messages that we have coming up. Guys, this is an amazing book. So I'm going to share with you just a few thoughts on this point and, uh, and give you some thoughts from Rick Warren, but I'm kind of reused them for my own. And I'm going to give you some thoughts and use an acronym that he uses in this book. And you can write this in your notes. He uses the, word, uh, the acronym SHAPE. S-H-A-P-E. Write that down. Each letter stands for something else. And they're going to help you discover who you are and how God has wired you specifically to serve Him with your life. The S stands for spiritual gifts. The H stands for heart. The A stands for abilities. The P stands for personality. And the E stands for experience. Now I'm going to spend a few minutes here on each one of these areas. And while I'm talking to about, about them, I want you to start thinking about your own life. 
How do these apply to me? Not how do they apply to my husband or my wife or my kids, but how do they apply to me specifically? So the first thing that I want you to look at is the importance of unwrapping your spiritual gifts. Unwrapping your spiritual <laughs> gifts. Guys, you know what? God gives every single believer a spiritual gift. At least one. Some people have more than one spiritual gifts, but He gives everyone at least one spiritual gift. And can I tell you, we need to understand that these aren't things that we can muster up on our own. Spiritual gifts aren't something that I can just pick and choose from, that I can muster up on my own. I want that gift, or I want this gift. It's a supernatural thing that God gives us, and we can't muster it up. You can't pick which one you want. You can't pick how many you get. There's nothing that you can do to earn it, because there's nothing that you've done to deserve it. That's what makes it a gift. That's what makes it a gift that He gives us. And they're an expression of God's grace to you and me. They're an expression. And He's the one who decides who gets what. He's the one who decides. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 12.11 says. 1 Corinthians 12.11 says, the Apostle Paul says this, The Holy Spirit distributes them to each one just as He determines. Isn't that cool? So you can take the pressure off yourself. You're not the one that gets to pick the spiritual gift that God gives you. He distributes it. He determines, not us. And guess what? No one has all of them. Not a single person possesses every single spiritual gift. Not you or not me. Every single one of us is different. And you know how come that is? It's because God wants to use them so we can learn how to love and depend on one another. Just think, if I had every spiritual gift, I wouldn't need you. Right? If you possessed every spiritual gift, you wouldn't need me. He gives them all differently so we can learn how to love and to lean on one another and depend. So guys, spiritual gifts, they're not given for your own benefit. They're not given for your own benefit. They are God-empowered gifts for serving Him for the benefit of others. And you know what? We are all blessed when everybody's walking out and experiencing their spiritual gift that God's gifted you. But you know what? We're also hurt when you're not serving using your spiritual gifts. Let me use an example here. I've got this terrible, terrible uh, scar on my arm and my hand. So, you know, as you know, I haven't always been a Christian. So in my BC days is how I developed this scar doing something really stupid one night, which I'm not going to go into detail what I was doing. But let me tell you, when I, when I got this happened, my whole hand was filleted open. And it was really, really gross. And I it cut my tendon. So this behind-the-scenes working part, my tendon was severed in half, and I had to have surgery and have that tendon put back. But can I tell you, when that was severed, when that was severed, I could lost the, the control of this finger right here that I now have back. I couldn't move my finger, and can I tell you that this tendon wasn't able to do its job, so everything else in my body, can I tell you, just my tendon wasn't affected. Every single part of my body hurt when this happened. Pain went through it all, and when that tendon, this behind-the-scenes thing, wasn't taking place, it didn't let my finger work, it didn't look, make my hand work, and it really messed things up. And as much as I wanted to use this tendon over here to do this job, it didn't happen because it wasn't created to do this one over here. So my whole body was affected. Guys, can I tell you, when you don't do and operate within the spiritual gift that God's called you to do, it affects the whole body of Christ. Right. Affects the whole body. God's put us all in this place together for us to not sit and do nothing. He's given you a gift. He says, unwrap your spiritual gift and do what I've called you to do so it can benefit others. It's not for you. It's to benefit others. But we all benefit when we all operate in this. So knowing your spiritual gift is one of the keys to discovering God's will for your ministry that He's called you to at Life Point Church. But you know the next key for discovering your part of ministry is learning, learning to listen to your heart. Learning to listen to your heart. You know the Bible uses the word heart to describe a lot of things. It uses the word heart to describe our desires, our hopes, our interests, our ambitions, our dreams, and our affections. It represents the source, the source of our motivation. Why we do what we do. It reveals what you care about most. Your heart reveals what's special and important to you. Listen to what Proverbs 29, or I'm sorry, 27, 19 says. It says, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. So one's life reflects the heart. So in other words, how I'm living reflects what's on the inside of me, right? 
It reflects what my importance is, what my priority is in my life. In other words, the heart reveals the real you. Good and bad. It reveals who you really are, good and bad. It determines why you say the things that you say. Have you ever heard somebody spew something out and say, I don't know where that came from? <laughs> came from what you're putting in you. It reveals who you are. It reveals what you say. It reviews, or, or, or it reveals how you feel, why you act the way that you do. You know, it's pretty amazing how the human body operates because we all have a unique heartbeat. Did you know that? We all have a unique heartbeat. I did not realize that until studying this out. You know, just like we all have a different thumbprint, we have different eye prints, we have different voice prints, out of the billions of people who ever live, no one has the same heartbeat exactly like yours. Isn't that pretty cool? It's pretty neat how God has designed the human body. But let me tell you else something, let me tell you something else that's pretty amazing. God has given each one of us a unique emotional heartbeat. A unique emotional heartbeat that races sometimes when we think of certain subjects. Have you ever started thinking about certain things before and all of a sudden your heart starts racing? Because you're getting excited? It starts racing when we start thinking about certain subjects, different activities, uh, different circumstances that interest you. You know what I'm talking about. There's some things we get excited about and some things bore us to tears, right? Just like this message might be boring some of you to tears and some of you might be excited about it. But there's different things in our life that gets us pumped. It gets us thinking about. Let me tell you another way to look at heart, uh, the heart. And the Bible gives it a lot too. Another word for heart is passion. It's our passion. What are you passionate about? You know, there's certain things that we're passionate about. Something things we're not. Where do you think those interests come from? Where do you think some of those things that you're passionate about comes from? It comes from God. <laughs> He's designed you specifically. He's put passions in your heart. He's put things in your heart that you get excited about. And some of the things that you get excited about, I don't get excited about. And some of the things that I get excited about, you don't get excited about. We're all different. You know what? God's put them in there. He's put those passions in there for you to serve Him with those passions. Are you using them for your selfish reasons? Because that's what we do sometimes. Don't ignore your interests. Don't ignore your passions. You know, several times throughout the Bible, the Bible says, serve God with all your heart. Then, serving with all your passions. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Guys, can I tell you there's a big difference between serving God out of obligation, right? And serving God out of passion. When you're serving Him with something that He's put on the inside of you to fulfill. He's given you a spiritual gift. He's given you some passions. Don't ignore your interests. Pray to God and ask Him, how can I use these passions that you've given me? How can I use them for your glory? How can I use them for your glory? The keys to discovering your ministry are unwrapping your spiritual gifts, listening to your heart, and applying your abilities. Applying your abilities. You know, your abilities are your natural talents that you were born with. We all got natural abilities that we we're uh, born with. You know what I'm talking about. Some people are gifted with their words, right? They can speak. They're eloquent speakers. They've, they've been speaking ever since they come out of the womb. And it's just something that they're gifted with. It's ability that God's given them. Other people have a natural athletic, uh, athletic ability. They're very coordinated. They pick up on sports. They pick up on things like that. They have an ability like that. Other people are gifted in academics. I'm not one of those. <laughs> And in fact, I wasn't even spelling academics right. I was like, how does that spell again? I'm free typing it. You know, my spell check has gotten to be where it says, dude, I have no idea what you're trying to say. <laughs> I'm like, I don't either. Let's just go with it. <laughs> so, you know, that's not one of mine, but some of you guys are. Some of you have the natural gift of music. Don't we enjoy the people with the ability of music? Every single Sunday, man, I love to hear the giftedness from the ability that God has given some of these people. Some people are gifted in administration. Man, they love the, the checks and the dots and the this and the that. All the organization, that's an ability that they've been given. Some people might be artistic. Some people are mechanical. And the list goes on and on and on. These are all God-given abilities that people have. Now, you might be sitting here this morning with the excuse, I have no ability. There's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that I'm good about. Fooey. That was one of them too. My spell check didn't come pick up all the way I spelled, but I finally got it worked out. <laughs> Fooey. Quit holding on to that excuse. 
We've all got a God-given ability that He's given us. And in fact, some of us probably have dozens, if not hundreds, of untapped, unrecognized, unused abilities that just lay dormant within. Listen to what studies have revealed. Studies reveal that the average person possesses 500 to 700 skills and abilities. That's pretty cool, isn't it? 500 to 700 skills and abilities. Listen, guys, you are God's handiwork. Remember, say handiwork. handiwork. You think He created you with no abilities? I think God's given you some abilities. And in fact, I think you're a bundle of incredible abilities that you're just not tapping into. Every single one of them can be used to bring Him glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, throughout the pages of Scriptures, you see the abilities that God gave people to bring Him glory. You know, when the tabernacle was built, when they made all the worship or the tools for utensils for worship, you know, God provided all the arts um, and all the craftsmen, and they all were different shaped with skills and ability and knowledge to get the job done. Can I tell you, God did the same thing here? When we remodeled this, it was amazing the construction people that God brought in, the people that did concrete, the people that were gifted in plumbing, in painting, in electricity, and the list goes on and on and on. All these gifts, these God-given gifts that people brought together to get the job done. You know, all the way throughout the Bible, you see people gifted in art, architectural, administration, baking, boat making, candy making, debating, designing, embalming, embroidering, engraving, farming, fishing, gardening, weapons, needlework, painting, planting, inventing, carpentry, sailing, selling, uh, being a soldier, tailoring, teaching, writing literature and poetry. It's amazing all the God-given abilities that God used in the Scriptures, and He still uses them today. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 6, it says that there's different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, is the same God at work. So all these are different gifts, but it's the same God at work to get the job done. Isn't that an amazing thing? Listen, guys, we are all different, but it's the same God working in all of us to make His body complete. You know, the other day... I had a single lady that called me and her car wouldn't start. And you know, she was a little bit financially strapped and didn't know really what to do. And I said, let me make a phone call. I made a couple of connections. I made a connection with a mechanic that we have here in the church. And can I tell you that that mechanic dropped everything, went over there, and put a new battery in his car, her car and, and volunteered his time. Now, so let me ask you, was he doing ministry work? Was he a mechanic or was he a minister? He was a mechanist. Uh, he, he was a mechanister. I have the gift with words. Amen. That's a spiritual gift. That's a gift. He was a minister using his mechanical skills. Amen. See, we all have them. Are you using your God given abilities? in His church to bring Him glory. And the keys to discovering your part in your ministry of LifePoint Church is unwrapping your spiritual gifts, listening to your heart, applying your abilities, and using your personality. Using your personality. Have I mentioned to you before how different we are? Isn't that pretty cool? If you're married, you know we're different than the people you live with, right? We're all different. We're all different. Listen to a unique, uh, how unique we are. This is something out of the Purpose Driven Life. I'm going to read this quote. Listen to what it says. This is talking about how unique each one of us truly are. DNA molecules can unite in an infinite number of ways. The number is 10, <laughs> get this number right, I think, 10 to the 2 billion 400 millionth power. I hope that's right. But here's the deal. That number is the likelihood that you would ever find somebody just like you. If you were to write out this number with each zero being about an inch wide, you would need a strip of paper 37,000 million or 37,000 miles long. Isn't that crazy? To put this in perspective, some scientists have guessed that all the particles, all the particles in the universe are probably less than 10 with 76 zeros behind it, which is far less than the possibility of your DNA. Listen, guys, you're unique, and that's a scientific fact. You are unique. Have you ever heard someone say when God made you, they threw away the mold? <laughs> Stands true for each one of us. God has made us all unique and given us all a different personality. You know, that's true for every single body in here, guys. God loves a variety of personalities. Just look around. 
Look around. There's introverts. There's extra, extroverts. There's people who love routine, people who love variety, people who play it safe, people who live on the edge, people who are thinkers. There's feelers. There's people who like to follow orders. There's people who like to give them. Right? Hopefully you're not married to the same person. You both like to give them. But you know what? We're all different. And there's no right or wrong temperament. God uses each one of our different personalities to get His work done. And He always has. Just think about the different personalities in the pages of Scripture. You know, all kinds of different. Peter was bold and he reacted before thinking. Paul was a thinker, but he was straightforward. Jeremiah was a feeler. All the twelve disciples were all different, but God used all these different temperaments, all these different personalities to turn the world upside down. Don't you think God can use our different personalities to still turn the world upside down? Wouldn't it be boring if everybody was plain old vanilla? I love vanilla, but man, that would be boring if that was the only flavor ice cream came in. You know, I love stained glass windows. We don't have any in here. But when you think of stained glass windows being all different pieces, all different colors, and their light reflects and shines through that, you know, that's all the different personalities that God uses for this beautiful picture to come together and reflect His Son, Jesus. You know what? My personality can reach people that yours can't. But you know what? Your personality can reach people that I can't. God's created us all different. Figure out and understand your personality so that you can know how God wants to use you. The keys to discovering your ministry are unwrapping your spiritual gifts, listening to your heart, applying your abilities, using your personality, and finally, putting your experiences to work for His glory. Putting your experiences to work for His glory. Guys, can I tell you, every single one of us are shaped by our experiences that we went through in life. Some experiences we brought on our own self, but some things we had no control over, how we were brought into this world. But you know what? God's allowed each one of our experiences to mold us and to shape us. Think about it. We've all got family experiences, right? How we were raised, what our parents put into us, whatever kind of environment that we grew up. We all have these family experiences. We all got educational experiences. You know, that's the extra learning that we've done, the different things that we have. We've got those experiences. We've got vocational experiences that goes into our life. What jobs we've had. Jobs that we've enjoyed doing. Jobs that we haven't enjoyed doing. Jobs that were really hard work that we just couldn't stand. And those that we're passionate about that it didn't even seem like we were working because we loved it so much. We've got those vocational experiences. We've got spiritual experiences. You know, the different things that we've had different meaningful times with God. We've got ministry experiences. How we've served God before in the past. But then we also have painful experiences. Painful experiences. And these are the problems that we've experienced in life, the hurts, the thorns, and the trials that we've all learned from. Guys, can I tell you this last one, our painful experiences, is where God can really use you to minister to other people. What? Our pain? I don't even want to talk about it. Those painful experiences is how God can really use us to minister. Think about it. Who better to minister to a parent with a special needs child than someone that has one? Right? Who better to minister to an alcoholic or a drug addict or someone struggling with pornography than someone who's overcome that addiction and has been truly set free? Isn't that right? Who better to minister to someone that's in a bad financial spot than someone who's learned the hard way and has figured out and put the right things in place. Isn't that right? Who better to minister to someone who's lost a child than someone who's lost one of their own? Who better to be an advocate for pro-life or foster care or adoption than someone who's aborted their child and God worked them through the emotional baggage that came with it? Who better to minister to someone who's struggling with depression than someone who God has pulled out of that pit? Who better to minister to a parent or a rebellious teenager than someone who's raised one of their own? Who better to minister to someone who received a bad report from the doctor than someone that's been led through on their own as well? Who better to comfort the wife whose husband left them for another than the woman who experienced the same agony of herself, of her own? Guys, can I tell you, God allows you to go through some stuff to equip you to minister to others. He allows you to go through some stuff to equip you to minister to others. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1.4. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. Woo! 
So we can comfort others. When others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. That's what that Scripture says. Listen, guys, if we really want to be used by God, if we really want to do our part and minister to others, then we have to understand this powerful truth. The very experience that we went through in life that we regretted, the very thing that we've tried to hide from, the very thing that, that was hard to go through, the very thing that we went through that we don't even want to talk about is the very thing that God wants to use in your life to help others. Can I tell you there's a good chance that's where your ministry is? Why do you think I get up here? Why do you think that I do what I do for a living? It's because my life was a wreck. I was an alcoholic with a failed marriage, but God has redeemed me from my past. And if I can stand up here and share with you what He did for me, then I can know that He can do that for others. I do what I do because that's how God shaped me. He's given me the spiritual gifts. He's given me the passion that I do what I do. He's given me the ability to do what I do. He's given me the personality to do what I do. And He's using my experiences from my past. That's how He shaped me. How has He shaped you to serve Him? Are you doing what God's called you to do? Would you stop running from your past and let Him redeem you from it? And use it for His benefit and His glory to help other people. How has God shaped you to serve Him? Unwrap your spiritual gifts. Listen to your heart. Apply your abilities. Use your personality. Let your experiences go to work for Him. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up as we, we close. I didn't forget your last point, so hold on. I want everybody stay still as we continue on. So is God leading you to partner with the ministry of Life Point Church? If so, you need to understand that every believer is a minister. Say that with me again. I'm a minister. I'm a minister. We need to believe that every minister does that for their part. Say, I'll do my part. I'll do my part. We do our part by being devoted, by giving financially, by figuring out how God shape us and use our gifts to serve Him. But finally, finally, it's critical that number three, that every part be done right. Every part be done right. That's our last scripture today in Romans 12, 11. It says, never be lazy. I like that. Isn't that just straight to the point? Never be lazy, but work hard to serve the Lord enthusiastically. Listen, guys, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Right? Let's not just... There's three people that wants to do it right. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Right? Man, let's get excited about how God's created us. Let's get excited about what God wants to do. Let's not be lazy people. Let's not be lazy and sit around and do nothing. Let's be hard workers. Let's be enthusiastic. Let's serve with a passion. That means we got to figure out how God's wired us so we're not doing stuff out of obligation. Let's understand how God's wired you, what your personality's like, all your experiences, everything. Why are you the way you are? You are God's handiwork to serve Him. Let's be ministers. Let's go out and do it with the right attitude. Listen, guys, the vision and the mission of Life Point Church can be found in your partnership agreement. And let me just sum it up to you what our mission and what our vision is. We believe that we want this to be a place where people in God collide and real life begins. Can I tell you, when you collide with God, it wrecks your life. It changes everything. You don't operate the same way you used to. You don't look the same way you used to. Everything is different. That's what it means to collide with God, is that He has changed my life from the inside out. And we believe that our vision is for people to collide with God and then mature as believers so we can start looking like Him. That's when that real life begins. But we do that for the purpose of reaching the unchurched in Chillicothe, Missouri. Amen? Because there's a lot of people out there that don't have Jesus in their life. And they need to see you changed. They need to see you serving God. They need to see, man, that's not the same guy I used to go to the bar with. That's not the same one that I used to do this with. Man, God's got a hold of their life, and they're different. And when we start living it out, when we understand that we're all ministers, and we're all connected in the body of Christ, doing the same thing, then we go the way God wants. Listen to it like this. Okay, so my head tells my body what to do. Isn't that right? My brains, my head tells my body what to do. So if I'm going to go that direction, guess what follows? My whole body's going that way. It's my vision. It's where I'm going. And in the process, my fingers might do something else. I might grab a bottle of water on the way over. I might do something else. I might do this. I might pick something up. I might do something different. But my body is doing what my head says. You know, Christ is the head of the church. 
He's the head of the church. We're the body of Christ. We all got a different role, but we go in the direction all together that He's called us to do. And that when we're all working together, when we're serving, when we're at the door, when we're picking things up, when we're going out and being ministers into the world, we're all together with the same purpose, the same vision, and that is what the Lord Jesus, the head, tells us to do. Amen? Amen. So are you a minister? Are you a minister doing your part, doing what God's called you to do, or have you been holding back? Are you all in? Can we count you in? You know, we're going to stand and we're going to worship God here in this song. And here's what we're going to do. If you've been holding back, if you've been holding back and you haven't been serving the way that you should, here's what I want you to do. The altars are open. Come in. Pray. If they fill up, man, just kneel out here. Kneel at your seats. Kneel at your seats right where you're at and say, God, I want to be all in. You can count me in. I believe in the ministry and I've been holding back. Use me. Use my life. Use my experiences. Use my personality. Use my God-given abilities. Use my spiritual gifts to bring you glory. If you don't know Jesus, I'm going to be up here. Mark will be up here. And we want to share first and foremost with you on that. Would you stand? Father God, we're coming before you in Jesus.